Th thank you for joining us. And uh, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Dora, for arranging the meeting. And I appreciate everyone who is uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to attend this uh, this uh, meeting during the lunch hour. So uh, just to introduce uh, myself, I'm a gastroenterologist. I have been in Reading since 2006. I have served at both the hospitals here. Currently, I'm the GI service director at Mercy Medical Center, as well as uh, I'm a partner at Reading Endoscopy Center the president-elect for North Valley Medical Association. So we're going to talk about endoscopic ultrasound. And uh, just, okay. So those of you who may know about endoscopic ultrasound. I hope you find some extra new information, but uh, if you are not familiar with it, I hope you will also find it useful as a primer. Please feel free to ask me any questions anytime you have. So endoscopic ultrasound stands for a sonography of the GI tract or the organs and tissue around the GI tract. Whether it's upper GI or lower GI. You may have heard of endobronchial ultrasound, similar way for the trachea and the lung cancers, but I'm going to limit myself today to GI endoscopic ultrasound. So it's like a regular endoscopy, but we have a different scope completely. It's a thicker scope, approximately 10 to 12 millimeter in size, depending on the brand, Olympus or Pentax. And it has two types, linear and radial. Here I have displayed a linear EUS scope, which is what we use 95% of the times. Unlike the regular scope, it has a lens on the side of the scope rather than tip of the scope. And this one also has a port from which a needle can come out from the side of the scope and it can be manipulated with an elevator up and down to reposition it. It also has ultrasound probe at the tip of it. That's what generates the, you can see that that's what generates the sonographic images. A little bit of background about the anatomy. This is the primary area which we do the EUS for. There are other areas in the esophagus and rectum also, but this is the major area which we do the endoscopic ultrasound for. For the retroperitoneal area behind the stomach, including the pancreas, as well as around the stomach, including the bile duct, blood vessels, lymph nodes, etc. So as you can see, this pancreas is a retrogastric, retroperitoneal organ. Behind that is aorta with a celiac artery with two branches and another artery, superior mesenteric artery is a second branch from aorta in the abdominal area. So we are primarily interrogating this area. So same way, portal vein, splenic vein coming this way and superior mesenteric vein coming this way and joining to become a portal vein going into the liver. Then you have the bile duct coming from the liver. This is the cystic duct. Bile duct joining the pancreatic duct, the common opening into the duodenum. So this is generally a very difficult area to image 
on ultrasound or CT scan or even MRI. Many times images are not so clear, they're not so precise, and you're unable to differentiate between a tumor versus the normal tissue, or you're unable to identify any lymph nodes or blood vessel involvement. Of course, you cannot biopsy it. It's very difficult to biopsy the tumors in this area, including the lymph nodes or the pancreas tumors or the bile duct tumors with an external biopsy like a radiology guided, CT guided biopsies because it's so much in the center of the body as well as it's surrounded by so many blood vessels, it can be dangerous. And that's one of the reasons pancreas carcinoma is extremely difficult to diagnose and we will talk more about it. And that's where the EUS has very, very handy access. So this is a, another diagram where the esophagus and this thing is EUS probe. You're showing the what area you can see near the G junction or cardia, then from the body, then from the duodenal bulb, and then the last third portion of duodenum, you can see different, different areas. So we go to different areas in a systematic fashion to interrogate all these specific areas. You can see part of the liver you can see, but not the entire liver. So this is, again, an image of US inside the stomach. This circular approach of imaging is possible with a radial scope. It shows 360 degree around the scope because waves are going all around. Whereas the linear scope, which I mentioned earlier, showed you earlier, has limited view of less than 180 degree, you can see, not 360 degree. However, we still use the linear scope most of the times because this is the one which we can use for biopsy with the needle. The radial one, we cannot. Around 20 years ago, when EUS started becoming practical and came out of the lab, at that time, most of us were starting with the radial scope, looking 360 degree, and then when we find a tumor, we'll go with the linear scope, change it to linear scope, and biopsy with the needle. However, with time, pretty quickly, we have developed enough experience that we can use the linear scope to interrogate the entire area without resorting to using the radial first. So that helps. First, procedure is shorter. You don't have to switch the scope. Second, once you find a tumor, you know where it is. You don't have to go again and look again and correlate the linear or radial image. So 95% of the times we're just using the radial scope now. The primary utility of uh, uh, endoscopic ultrasound is in the diagnosis and staging of uh, different cancers, including esophagus, all the GI tract, esophagus, stomach, pancreas, biliary, rectum, but also in diagnosing and staging the lung cancer and lymphoma, because you can interrogate the mediastinum very well with it. You can see the lymph nodes, biopsy them. Many of them cannot be reached by bronchoscopy or bronchoscopic ultrasound. Lymphoma, same way, mediastinal lymph nodes or abdominal lymph nodes, you can diagnose very well with the, the endoscopic ultrasound. Also useful in Evaluation of Barrett's esophagus, benign conditions like Barrett's esophagus, neuroendocrine tumor, again for biopsies, pancreatic cyst, as well as pancreatitis, bile duct stones, sarcoidosis, and cyst. Again, just are the tumors of gastrointestinal stromal tumor, benign, or kind of a, what we call mesenchymal tumor, which may have a malignant potential. Staging of tumor is also very useful as we know for planning of therapy, and you need to know the tumor stage, which includes depth and a size, and that's EUS excels in that. There is no other modality which can tell you which layer of GI tract is involved. Only EUS can tell you that, and we will talk a little bit more about that. And also we can diagnose, and we can also see the lymph nodes much better on EUS compared to the CT scan or MRI, and we can biopsy them. 
For pancreatic cancer, vascular involvement is extremely important to know before sending the patient for surgery. And EOS again excels at that. Of course, liver metastasis can biopsy that also. So these are the five layers of GI tract. The first one is a white layer, is epithelium. Second one is a black layer, which is a muscularis mucosa. Third one, white layer, is the submucosa. Fourth one is muscularis propria, and fifth one is serosaur adventitia. So EUS images are only black and white. Sonographic, uh, sonographic waves, they are either reflected or absorbed or allowed to pass through. If they are reflected by a layer, then it will be seen as a white layer. If it is allowed to, if it is absorbed, then it will be seen as a black layer. So the, these five layers are very important. First and second, epithelium and muscularis mucosa are part of the mucosa. Generally, if the tumors are limited to that, they can be removed with a simple endoscopic intervention by doing a mucosal resection. However, if they involve submucosa, then they need a deeper resection and endoscopic resection usually doesn't work. Fourth one, muscularis is important to know because once that's involved by the tumor, then many of the stages of tumor will stages at least T2 and they may require chemo radiation prior to the surgery. Certainly so if the white layer or uh, zero size involved. And this is important in the tumors of esophagus, stomach and rectum. So that will define whether they need a pre-op neoadjuvant chemo radiation. EUS is also useful in therapeutics like celiac plexus neurolysis. And let me just go back to this image here because around the celiac artery trunk, there are four ganglion, which are nerve ganglion and pancreatic cancer can cause severe pain and you can go in and inject those lip mud ganglion with absolute alcohol to kill the nerves and reduce the pain of the pancreatic cancer. This also can be useful for gastrocystostomy for pancreatic pseudocyst. We have something called axios stent, which is a metal stent and is much wider than the plastic stent, can be placed between the stomach and the cyst of the pancreas if they are large enough to drain it. Works very well. It does have a risk of causing bleeding when the cysts shrink. So uh, that has to be kept in mind, but it's a very effective tool, especially if you have a pancreatic surgeon backup in your hospital. I wouldn't recommend that if you don't have a backup by a pancreatic surgeon in your hospital because sometimes they can bleed and cause problems or migrate, but most of the time they work very well. Then it can also be used for ERCP if there's so much of blockage that you cannot cannulate. There are some future potential like injecting the pancreatic cancer with some uh, uh, adenovirus, which have been gene modified and all that. And, uh, but those are future potential, not yet. This is again going over the layer involvement and staging from T1S to T1B. But when the muscular is properly as involved, then it is T2 and beyond that is T3. The utility in the lung cancer here, you can see that esophagus is right behind the trachea and the lymph nodes in the mediastinum are very well seen on the EOS and they can be potentially biopsied. In fact, some of the uh, lymph nodes cannot be biopsied by bron EBUS or bronchoscopic ultrasound. So it's actually more valuable than that compared to the uh, EBUS. This is an example of the lymph node, oh, sorry, a tumor. The dark thing is tumor, which is kind of absorbing the, um, the absorbing the ultrasonic waves. 
and uh, uh, but uh, not reflecting them and it's darker and uh, that's causing the tumor to be darker than the surrounding areas and there's a needle going into that you can take a biopsy so this is let's just uh, okay this is in the rectal ultrasound rectal ultrasound is where we use a radial scope and you can see the 360 degree view this is the prostate up there and this is a lymph node around the tumor this is the tumor darker thing tumors are generally hypoechoic which means they're darker they don't reflect as much as a calcium the calcium or bone or air will reflect the eus waves back and nothing will go through them that's why they'll appear white whereas tumors will appear darker blood will appear black and everything else will appear somewhat in between, like a salt and pepper kind of appearance. This is an actual example of one of my cases here. You can see a big tumor there, which is dark, rounded, almost homogeneous, maybe some heterogeneity. And there's a lymph, uh, there's a needle going into the tumor to take a biopsy. This is another example. As you can see, this is the white layer, is the initial epithelium. Then there are different layers. This is the pancreas. This is the tumor. And there's a needle going into that. And you can see the shadow of the needle. That's how we know needle, how deep the needle is in. And we can see how much deeper can we go. We can go from all the way here to there to take the pieces. We don't want to go beyond that. This is the portal vein. So you can see there's a clear separation between them. So there is no invasion of portal vein. Let me just show you the video here that may be useful here. Okay, I may have to switch out of this view to So sorry, it's just going to um, have an ad I have to skip. Okay, can you see this US uh, video screen? No. No. Okay, okay, let me just pull this up. Can you see this now? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to see the video uh, that how it's.
So, okay, let me just go back to that. Okay, so that was a slide, that was a, a kind of a good animation for understanding exactly how it is done. Any questions about that? If not, then I will move for, excuse me, I'll move further down. So the same way you can also see here, you can go into the stomach or the duodenum and look at the liver. And if you find the metastasis there, then you can biopsy them. Many times CT scans or MRI can miss these metastases in the liver and they can only be seen on endoscopic ultrasound. There have been times when I have seen identified small metastasis, seven, eight millimeter, eight millimeter, less than a centimeter and biopsy show the metastatic tumor to the liver. And it's extremely important to know that before you send your patient unnecessarily for the surgery, because many of the pancreatic cancer patients or biliary patients may have liver mats, which makes them inoperable. But if you don't know that pre-op, patient will end up getting an unnecessary surgery. They just an open it shut. They open it, see the liver mats, and they close that. So unnecessary surgery can be avoided. This is another example of a lymph node. You can barely see it here, but uh, it's kind of uh, reading the cloud. Sometimes it's people say, what are you talking about? I don't see anything. You know, you're just imagining things. It is like imagining things, but with experience, you get used to reading these things where you can see this mass, whereas the rest of the tissue appears to be more whitish. And this is the lymph node, uh, which is being biopsied, and you can see the needle going into that. This is an example of a gallbladder stone. This is the gallbladder. This is a stone. We are only seeing the superficial surface because the calcium is reflecting the waves and we have what we call beam blocking or a shadowing below them. So this is classical gallstone. Another thing I mentioned was celiac plexus neurolysis. You can see this celiac artery axis coming from the aorta and then there are four ganglion. In the Doppler view, you can see this is the aorta, this is the celiac artery, and this is the lymph node, sorry, ganglion, where you are putting a needle in it and injecting it with absolute alcohol. This is an example of a cyst, the pancreas. It has, it's completely black, which means it is filled with the water. It does not have any solid component, which would have been more grayish or salt and pepper or white. It doesn't have any calcium, which would be white. So coming to chronic pancreatitis, also useful to differentiate normal pancreas from chronic pancreatitis, which is suggestive of chronic damage and that features are, if there's a more hyperechoic foci, strands, cysts, scarring, basically reflecting the scarring, and also ductal changes. But the pancreatic neoplasm is the one I really want you to know because it has a very high mortality. It's the fourth leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States. And for some unknown reason, I have seen a lot of pancreatic cancer in our North state. I don't know the reason behind it, but I have seen a lot more frequent than other areas, as well as I've seen in much more younger population. I don't know if it's because of the pollution of the water or soil from our historical use of land for mining or gold, especially gold mining, silver mining, or use of lumber industry, uh, use of chemicals in the lumber industry. I have been thinking about doing a study on the epidemiology of it. One day when I get a time, I will do that. And hopefully some residents can help me. But extremely important because very difficult to diagnose, very deadly, especially because of the involvement of portal veins, superior mesenteric artery, which are very close to the tumor. 
and the surgery with the being a Whipple is very difficult. Risk factor, smoking, high BMI, non-hereditary pancreatitis, hereditary pancreatitis, and some cystic neoplasm of pancreas. So ultrasound and CT scan, ultrasound especially is not very useful. CT with the pancreatic protocol is more useful, but many times even CT will miss the tumor and you just have to suspect it if the patient has poor appetite, weight loss, with or without pain. Joindus is generally a late feature. And EOS is the best diagnostic test. Surgical resection is only potentially curative. Chemotherapy is useful, but not very effective or definitely not curative yet. Unfortunately, only 15-20% of the patients who have pancreatic cancer are curative candidates for surgery because they usually present late and they already have the vein or artery involvement. And even those who go for surgery, five-year survival rate is pretty poor. CN19.9 is a tumor marker, is useful in monitoring, but not in diagnosis. So CT, PET scan, and EOS are the best option for diagnosis, staging, and resectability. But the biopsy, for biopsy, you need EOS. Shows the survival curve, looks pretty bad. Okay. I mean, the EOS is useful in pancreatic cancer for diagnosis, biopsy of the pancreas, lymph node, liver mats, as well as staging of lymph node and liver mats, as well as resectability to decide if they have an SMA or celiac artery involvement, which are completely, and which are absolute contraindication for surgery. Portal vein involvement, you can sometimes operate, especially if you give them pre-op neoadjuvant chemo radiation. Pain management with the celiac plexus neurolysis, which I discussed earlier. Also, it's useful in incidental pancreatic cyst, but when, see, pancreatic cysts are very, very common nowadays found on ultrasound or CTS incidental finding. Most of the time, you don't have to worry about them unless they are three or more centimeters or they have a dilatic duct or they have an associated solid component. But if you have any concern and the picture is not clear, the EOS is useful to define these criteria. You can also put a needle in the cyst and take some tissue, uh, but tissue generally is absent because they're fluid filled and you can check the CEA level. If that's high, it's suggestive of pre-malignant, but not malignant. This is a cartoon for ERCP. I'm just gonna skip that because we're not talking about that. I can go over the uh, ERCP animation if someone is interested. But let's go to this thing and uh, this is, a good one to show you how US actually is done with the biopsy. I showed the animation, but this is live. This is a good friend of mine from Montreal. He's a great expert in US, as well as a great teacher. And he has taught a lot of people all over the world. So they have some excellent video.
See his, see the motion of his hand. Okay, so any questions? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. I just, I just wanted to make sure that I don't put everyone to sleep. Someone is awake. Someone is listening. So uh, that's the presentation I have, but I'll be happy to take any questions and try to answer them if you have any questions. Thank you. I, I This is Andy Miller, Dr. Miller. I don't have any questions. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. If you have any the question, let me know. Otherwise, I do want to just take a minute or two to talk about uh, uh, an upcoming event we have for uh, with the North Valley Medical Association. Bridget, I don't know if you have the flyer you can put up. 